little, about, a little bit about Alex. Alex Vitali is a professor of sociology and coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. For the past 25 years, Dr. Vitali has been advancing critical studies of policing inside and outside of academia, especially since the uprisings in Ferguson and Baltimore. Communities all over the country have been trying to turn protests born out of justified outrage about policing into meaningful and lasting change. Uh, especially in these years, Alex has been a valuable public intellectual, clearly assessing the roots of contemporary problems associated with policing, as well as the pitfalls and dead ends inherent to many of the various reforms that, that have been put forward and that are currently being put forward. Uh, Professor Vitali is the author of numerous articles as well as two books, one of which is City of Disorder, How the Quality of Life Campaign Transformed New York Politics, and then more recently in the subject of this talk, The End of Policing. Professor Vitali is here to share some of his thoughts and analysis on policing. Let's open up a dialogue about the types of initiatives many people in this room have been engaged in, what more needs to be done, and how we might start building the type of city that we want and deserve. So please join me in welcoming him here today. You're like my students. No one wants to sit in the front row. Uh, well, we got <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for coming out, everybody. Uh, here, how, we got a camera, so let me, is that a good spot? All right. Uh, I'll try to stick to a spot here. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I do come to Providence once in a while, and I now have a nephew who goes to school here in town, so uh, I hope to come back again in the future as well. <coughs> So uh, let me uh, tell you a little story. So I got a call from a journalist a little while back, as I often do around policing issues. And she was calling about uh, the city council in New York wanting to hold hearings about the way the police in New York handle responses to mental health crisis calls. And the reason for the hearing was because of a, a tragic incident. A uh, middle-aged African-American woman named Deborah Danner, who lived in public housing in the Bronx, uh, had a history of mental health problems, and her neighbor felt that she was experiencing some kind of crisis in her apartment and called 911 to get her help. And what she got was an armed police response, and they forced their way into her apartment and forced their way into her bedroom. And after some kind of a scuffle that there remains disputes about exactly what happened, uh, the sergeant in charge uh, shot her to death in her home. Despite the fact that he had a taser, despite the fact that he had had special training about how to respond to these calls. And the reality is, is that between a quarter and half of all people killed by police in the United States are having a mental health crisis at the time that they're killed. This is a huge problem. And so our city council, our very progressive city council in New York, they wanted to hold hearings about this crisis, but the focus of the hearings and the reason for the phone call was to discuss whether or not New York was giving the right training to officers, whether the training was being implemented quickly enough. So I start thinking about the Memphis model and crisis intervention training and some of the other approaches to how police should respond to mental health calls. And, and I stopped myself and I, I stopped the reporter and I said, you know, I'm not really interested in trying to fine tune the police response to these calls. I'm interested in ending it. Because the reality is that police are the wrong institution to be responding to these calls. But it has become a huge part of what police do. In New York City, they go on a quarter of a million of these calls every year. And it's true the vast majority of them do not involve someone getting killed, thankfully. And police work very hard to try to avoid that. But even when they do their job properly, even when they follow the training correctly, what outcomes do they have as a result of that? Well, they can arrest someone because they're you know, out of control in that situation and they don't know what else to do or because they violated some minor law. So then they get put into the criminal justice system, which has very few resources 
And if they get locked up, they end up in solitary confinement with very limited access to any kind of decent care. And usually they're back out on the streets pretty short time thereafter. <clears throat> Maybe they end up in an emergency room. But what can an emergency room do? Right now, they have so few resources that if you're lucky, the person gets held for one day, a few days, maybe stabilized, given some medication, and then basically turned back out on the streets, maybe with a bottle of pills, maybe with a follow-up to some clinic. Or maybe the officer just tries to calm the situation down in the moment and leave the person on their own. But none of these result in that person being connected to high quality mental health care on some kind of ongoing basis. Because we just don't have any such mental health infrastructure. We've decided to create a situation where there's almost no access to high quality mental health services, especially for poor folks and then turn the problem over to the police and then when the police make mistakes we say well let's give the police more training more resources you know have them partner with social workers instead of directly confronting the problem which is there's no mental health services now why is it that a progressive city council like the New York City Council is stuck in this mindset? Well, there's two reasons. One is that they're caught up in this proceduralist mindset, a kind of legal formalism, that says that if we can just get everyone to follow the rule of law, everything will be better for everyone. And in terms of police, this means trying to get the police to be more professional, better trained, less biased, and more focused on following the law. And the belief here is that all the problems with policing, all these horrible, high-profile incidents, would kind of go away if we could just get a few police to be a little bit more professional, to, to not be so quick to shoot, to not be so quick to beat someone up. And how do we do that? Well, we do that for these legal formalists or proceduralists, the way they think they can do that is by constantly implementing new training, new resources, maybe some accountability measures, and that this will somehow fix everything. And this is kind of the mindset behind the Community Safety Act here in Providence, which is can we just get the police to follow their own rules and to behave more professionally? but I don't think this is going to help, and here's why. Let's think about some of the training and procedures that are being talked about. One of my favorites is implicit bias training. Who's, who's heard of this, implicit bias training? Right, it's very popular now. It's all the rage. Companies use it for hiring practices. Schools use it, and of course, it's become a signal feature of police reform. So implicit bias training is based on the idea that people have unconscious, unaware, unintentional racial stereotypes that might affect their views in some way about different groups. And they've developed all these complex tests with video monitors and brain scans and everything to try to show a scientific basis for this implicit bias. But all of this is predicated on the idea that the problems of race and policing are ones of individual level discretionary decision making by officers that's unintentional. Well, the first problem with this is that we've got a lot of explicit racism in policing. It's not unconscious and unintentional. When we look at the emails, when we find the chat boards, when we read the official statements of police union leaders across the country, we find a lot of explicit racism. No amount of implicit bias training is going to affect that in any meaningful way. But there's really a bigger problem, because even that, thinking of the problem as individual racist cops, 
you know, doesn't hold up in all parts of the country. You've got cities now where a majority of officers are non-white, the police leadership is non-white, in places like Baltimore and Detroit, and even Los Angeles and New York, this is often the case. Uh, the problems of race and policing are not at the level of individual officer discretion. They're built into the mission of policing. A totally lawful, professional, unbiased drug arrest is going to ruin some young person's life for no damn good reason. There is no justice in that. N Narcotics officers do not need anti-bias training. We need to get rid of the war on drugs. We've had this war on drugs for almost 50 years. Drugs are cheaper, easier to get, and more potent than they've ever been. We got overdoses through the roof. Any young person in the United States can get any kind of drugs anytime they want them. Does anyone here think there are young people who don't know how to get illegal drugs? No, nobody thinks that. We have nothing to show for 50 years of drug war except putting millions of people into prison. But anybody can get any kind of drugs they want. So what is this drug war really about? It's certainly not about keeping people from getting drugs. It's about a toxic racial politics backed up by moral crusades that want to shift the focus away from public health and public safety to moralistic finger wagging and the criminalization of whole communities. And that is not justice. And making that drug war more professional or unbiased is not the solution. The solution is to get police out of the drug business. To look at things like harm reduction strategies, drug legalization, retail distribution or pharmacy distribution of drugs, real public education around drugs, peer-to-peer -peer models, etc. But implicit bias training wants us to think that if only we could just get the narcotics officers to be more racially aware that somehow then we could get back to waging the war on drugs and everything will be fine. Why is it that, well let me think about it this way, so the, the, the way in which racism is baked into this is not just the war on drugs, it's crime more generally. So the police will always say when we accuse them of structural racism, they'll say, well, we just go where the calls for service are. We just go where the crime is. Now, first of all, this isn't entirely true, and it's certainly not true around drug enforcement. But even to the extent that it is true, there's a reason why crime is heavily concentrated in certain places. And that is a conversation about hundreds of years of intentional, explicit racial exploitation. America is as residentially segregated today by race as it's ever been in its history. And one of the primary ways that racial inequality is reproduced in the United States is the way schools are funded, by making it based on very local property taxes. And the fact that the students who need the most help get the fewest resources. But instead of trying to use progressive taxation to offset those deficits, we turn the problems of schools over to the police to solve. So I know folks here are working to try to get counselors instead of cops, but how did we get all these cops in the first place? Well, there were really three factors at work in the 1990s that got us into this mess. One was the development of the super predator myth. This was a popular idea in the 1990s promulgated by deeply conservative intellectuals who were motivated by politics, not research, and they came up with this idea 
that a small number of very serious juvenile crimes spread out across the country that got a lot of media attention were an indicator of some future wave of youthful sociopaths who would sooner kill you as look at you that were going to take over the country and that we could expect an explosion of youth violence in schools, communities, etc. This idea became very popular with politicians and media pundits despite the fact that it was based on entirely bogus data and every year since that prediction was made juvenile crime has fallen in the United States. But this did not prevent politicians across the country from charging juveniles as adults, putting juveniles in adult prisons, and flooding our schools with police. All of this under the Clinton administration. The next factor was disinvestment in public schools. The 1990s is the beginning of the school privatization, charter school, high stakes testing era. George W. Bush is, is governor of Texas when he ushers in all these changes to education that allows them to reduce funding and to drive out the low performing students into either alternative schools that look like jails or into the juvenile justice or adult justice systems. And then he is credited with this Texas miracle because test scores went up. It turns out the only reason the test scores went up was because they kicked 20% of the kids out of school and the alternative schools were not part of the testing regime. So what do you do when a school cuts all the extracurricular activity, all the counselors, and then everything you do in the classroom is to prep for a test, high stakes testing. The kids are not getting services they need, class is boring, frustrating, and there's no positive ways of dealing with that, and so kids act out, and there are problems, and this gets turned over to the police to solve. The last factor, was the Columbine shooting in Colorado. It happens in the 90s. All these things are coming together in the 90s. This created a lot of hysteria about how dangerous schools were and how unprotected kids were, despite the fact that schools are the safest place that young people spend time, safer than their homes, safer than their communities, safer than any job they have. This is despite the fact that there were armed police at Columbine that day. And it made no difference. There were armed police in Parkland, Florida, where that shooting happened. It made no difference. It did not save any kids. We have got to create a different kind of school environment where young people are involved in producing a safe and stable working environment where young people are treated with respect and are invited to be part of producing the educational environment, not constantly surveilled and criminalized at every turn and told to sit still and do what you're told. When young people are disrespected, when they, when they have problems at home in the community, and when school sucks for them because of the regimentation, the teaching to the test, there are going to be problems. We've got to flip that whole equation on its head. So the last, so then when, when young people complain about abusive school police, what's the response? Give the school police more training. Get the school police to be nicer. Ask school police to be mentors. To maybe take a social work class. We don't need nicer school police. We don't need better trained school police. Uh, we certainly don't need school police to be mentors to our young people. We need no school policing. It is a horrible idea, and in fact, there is no research at all that says that it makes young people safer. It doesn't. In fact, there was just a major study release that said students are not safer, these police are not preventing shootings, and young people don't feel safer in schools with police and metal detectors. It's a total failure. 
So the last proceduralist reform I want to talk about is community policing. Who could be against community policing? Don't, don't we want the police to, to know who's who in the community, to be able to tell who the good people are and the bad people are, to solve problems collectively? Well, there are a lot of problems with community policing. First of all, this idea that the police are sorting out who the good people are and the bad people are is really misguided because the world is not divided up that way. That's the way police see the world, this whole thin blue line idea. This is the idea that you know there are good people on one side and bad people on the other side, and police, their job is to police the line between those two groups. It's a very black and white, good and bad, Manichaean kind of worldview. But that's not the reality of these communities, of any communities. Good people do bad things. Good people make bad decisions, make mistakes, cause problems. That mindset leads to what we have today, which is basically a, a, a view that the way we save 80% of the community is to eliminate 20% of the community. And that doesn't sound like justice to me. But also, for community policing, what is the community of community policing? We just automatically assume, oh, there's this community that the police will engage with. But actually, all the research done on community policing across the country shows that the community in community policing is the community that the police choose. There are no young people at these police community meetings. There are no undocumented people, no homeless people, no people who are out on parole or who have a drug problem. There are very few poor people, renters, etc. There are landlords and business owners and church ladies. It's a very small, unrepresented group of the community. But let's imagine that there really was community representation and that the community really was bringing its problems to the police to solve. But to me, that's the biggest problem with community policing. Because what tools do the police have to solve our community problems? Guns, handcuffs, ticket books, threats, coercion, violence. These are the tools that police have. Do police have access to affordable housing, drug treatment services, trauma services for young people who've been exposed to violence, mental health counseling? They don't have any of that. Those are the things that our communities really need. Not people with guns and handcuffs trying to put people in prison. And this really gets back to the second part of the problem that I started with. Our city council thinking that either procedural reforms are, are the solution or the second part, which is that they're committed to a politics of austerity. And this is a bipartisan problem across the country. That the politicians have given up on the idea that they can use the power of local government to raise resources to try to reduce inequality and to build communities up. And part of this is about global competition. Sure, there's pressure there, but there's an ideological problem as well. They basically accepted the idea that free markets and subsidizing the already successful is the only way to go. And so the few dollars that they do scrape together, they give away to the most successful developers, the richest people, the most successful corporations in hopes that they'll stick around. And another central part of that is that when social problems emerge as a result of this huge growing inequality problem that produces things like mass homelessness, untreated health problems, drug addiction, involvement in black markets, it's essential that they frame those problems as one, as one of individual and group moral failure. You did that because you're bad, your parents are bad, and the only response they can imagine to that is a punitive response. 
And so in, it, once we've established that your bad behavior is because of your bad morals, the thing to do is to lock you up. Right in line with the most kind of conservative religious thinking, which has a lot of adherence in high crime neighborhoods. People are desperate. But this austerity politics has become so powerful, so bipartisan, has been around so long that yes, in a community with a lot of problems, where people have been told for 40 years the only thing you can have to solve your community problems is more police, people will say, well, bring us more police if that's the only thing we can have. But the point we need to be demanding is why can't we have the things that will actually make our community better? Every time they want to offer us more police, we've got to say, why can't we have affordable housing? Why can't we have drug treatment on demand? Why can't we have unlimited summer youth jobs? Any young person who wants a job should be able to walk up and get a job. And not just for the summer, ideally. We've got to convince local government to get back into the business of intervening in markets, housing markets and employment markets, but that's exactly what they don't want to do. That's why they frame this as a problem of moral failure, <clears throat> because the alternative would be to acknowledge that these are the result of market failures. That when we built labor and housing markets that are designed to fail a third or more of the population, we're going to have social problems. We're going to have drug problems. We're going to have black markets. We're going to have mass homelessness. And instead of criminalizing those things, we need to be demanding real solutions to those things. Now the good news is, is you know, despite the failures of the New York City Council to embrace this, a lot of places are starting to come to grips with this. So let me just mission, mission, mention a few, and then we'll have some time for conversation. So the first uh, is the Ithaca plan in Ithaca, New York. Ithaca is an upstate New York small town, and guess what? They have a drug problem, like every place in America has a drug problem. But the mayor there understood that police were not part of the solution. They were not helping. So he said, what if we put everything on the table, everything that we could possibly do is open for discussion. We're going to bring in some experts, some academics, some researchers, and some people who been involved with drugs and drug treatment and the criminal justice system, and we're going to try to come up with a comprehensive solution, or at least positive intervention, into the problems of drugs in Ithaca. And so that's what they did. They brought folks in, worked on some ideas, but they didn't stop there. They took it out into the communities. They held town hall meetings, they did focus groups to try to see if we could get a large number of people on the same page. And out of that came the Ithaca plan. And there are no cops in it. There's drug treatment on demand, safe injection facilities, needle exchange, peer-to-peer -peer education programs, targeted economic development initiatives, the kinds of things that would actually make a difference in reducing both the demand for drugs and involvement in black markets of drug dealing. This is the kind of thinking that's needed. And it's not enough to just put it in a white paper and circulate it. It has to be done with communities. So that brings me to my second example, the Build Communities Initiative that's emerged in New York. It came out of Just Leadership USA, which is leading the Close Rikers campaign. And what folks have realized is it's not enough to just point out the horrors of Rikers Island, as bad as they are. To really win this battle, we have to have a different vision of public safety that shows that 
there's an alternative to relying on police and jails to make communities safe. And so they did something similar to the Ithaca plan where they brought in academics, community-based organizations, community leaders to talk about what, what do we really need to make these communities better so we don't call the police. And so they wrote up reports on housing, education, youth services, medical care. They put dollar amounts on things and they pointed out that the dollars that are being spent on policing and jails could cover a huge amount of these positive interventions. And then the last, I had uh, the opportunity to go out to Salinas, California a couple months ago where they built a broad-based coalition under the heading Build Healthier Communities and they've developed a kind of people's budget these are the things we need for our community. And they made the politics of this very concrete. Rather than just abstractly saying, here's a new budget, they said, we've got to change the politics of Salinas in order to get these kinds of victories. So they picked a specific city council district with a politician in there who should be their friend but isn't. And all their organizing is targeted in that specific city council district. Town hall meetings, door-to-door -door organizing, house meetings, around the kinds of basic demands that would make that community safer. Things that that politician won't vote for, but is always ready to vote for a new jail, hiring more police, a new youth lockup. So making it a concrete political threat, not just based on picking some good candidate with a good platform, but doing the actual community organizing to build a constituency for a new vision of public safety. And they had a big victory just before I was there. The city said, oh, we got this free money from the Justice Department to put cops in the schools. It's not going to cost us anything. Isn't this great? And because folks have been organizing, they were able to respond quickly and they said, not so fast. Yeah, we got problems in our schools, problems that could be solved by hiring more coaches and social workers and counselors, not by putting police in the school. And guess what schools they wanted to put the cops in? Elementary schools. Why? This is actually how school policing got started in the 1950s. There were youth violence problems in the U.S. in the 1950s, and police around the country said, we want to put cops in the elementary schools. Is there gang battles and shootings in elementary schools? No. So why put them in the elementary schools? To teach the kids respect for authority. And that's what they wanted to do in Salinas. They said it explicitly. We want to start when they're young so that they learn that police are their friends and that what they need to do to get by is to respect authority, meaning people with guns, telling them what to do. And this is the solution to community problems, to the problems of young people, is to get them to be obedient to police when they're in elementary school. And they called bullshit on that in Salinas and put a stop to it. They got the city, uh, the school boards there to vote against it. This is the kind of organizing that's going to bring about the relief that we want from abusive policing. No amount of training or procedural reforms are going to prevent the problems that are at root about the overextended mission of policing. When we tell police to get into every aspect of our lives, to be the tool for solving every social problem, to wage a war on crime, a war on drugs, a war on immigrants, a war on gangs, a war on disorder, they cannot be friendly, 
They cannot be professional, they cannot do community policing, and they are not going to make our communities any safer. Thank you.